scripture reading for today is James 1, verse 2 to 4. My brethren, count it all joy when you all fall diverse temptations, knowing this that the trying of your faith work patience. But let patience have perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. Good morning. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. How was everybody's week? Just get my things all set up. All right, so I will just repeat the memory of the scripture reading that was just before. So the title of my message for this morning is Standing the Task. Scripture reading is found in James 1, verse 2 to 4. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So that was our scripture reading today. And God is good? All the time. And all the time? God is good. Good. So that used to be one of my favorite phrases while growing up. And it's a good reminder for us throughout the week to remember that God is always good to us. Now I wanted to share something personal with you, Church. I am not worthy to stand up here today. And though I've had many instances where I was able to speak in the past, it still gets me a little bit nervous coming up here. And there will be times where you will hear me stutter or where you will, um, when my mind will go blank. But it's because I like to be there with you. And I'm not the type of person who likes to be up here in front of everyone. And it's funny because you think that just because I'm a teacher that I love speaking in front of people, that I love speaking in front of children and students. But it's funny because it's been nearly four years that I've been running away from God's call. And I remember introducing myself to you in the past, and I told you that being a teacher was never part of my plan. But by God's grace, it was part of his plan. Amen? Amen. Amen? So there are many times where we have a tendency to run away from God's calling. But guess what, my friends? We are worthy. And we need to claim that promise that God will do anything and everything to equip those who are unqualified. So, with today, I wanted to let you know that this whole week, I have been struggling and not wanting to come up here and speak to you. But um, just last night, I was able to finish what I would share with you, 2 a.m. in the morning. So bear with me, as I'm still a little bit sleepy, but um, I hope that you and I can dive into God's word this morning. And one thing I'd like to share is, is that ever so often, 
even if I'm running away from God, there's always that resistance with myself, but there is no peace of mind. And at the end of it, I had the tendency to surrender to God and say, here I am. I'm sorry for being so stubborn, but what is it that you want me to do? Provide for me the resources, the support that I need to accomplish what you need for me to do. And so, my brothers and sisters, it was never part of my plan to come here to Victoria. It was always my plan to stay in Ontario and have a future there and settle down back at my home. But you know that with God's plan, anything can be unexpected. And so I took that leap of faith, and now here I am, standing in front of you. I'm also a proud member of the Lakeview Christian School, and they have been very supportive of me, so I am glad to be part of this community and with Lakeview, uh, I mean with uh, Victoria SPA Church. So I'd like to, for you to turn to your neighbor and say, listen and obey. Oh, my brothers and sisters, I think my students can be better than you. I can't hear you. Listen and obey. Listen and obey. Thank you. So, one of the phrases that I grew up with as well, one of the models that my parents taught me was... So, listen, obey. By listening, you will learn. By obeying, you shall be saved. Isn't that a nice model? Yeah. So with that, I'd like for us to bow our heads in prayer and we will dive right in. God, Heavenly Father, be with us this morning as we study your word. May your Holy Spirit dwell in this worship service and may our hearts and minds be receptive to your word. Use me, O oh Lord, as your humble mouth. And I pray that at least one person here today will be touched by this morning. Please forgive us, O oh Lord. So, we serve a God every now and again that will test us. I don't know about you, but I don't like tests. Now, some enjoy a challenge and love it. Do you love tests? I guess you could say it depends on what you are being tested on, right? But for me, to be perfectly honest with you, if I know that I'm entering a test and I'm not confident and I'm not prepared, then I find myself stressing about it. And for some of us youth, if we have come to the point that we stress, we go numb. And we say, you know what, I don't care, I will just wing it. So for those of you who don't know what wing it means, it means whatever the results of the test will be what it is. Well, that's what it will be. It is what it is. Now I remember a friend in high school. She was beautiful, very intelligent, and quite unearned. To the point that she would be studying every weekend with no breaks in preparation to our final exam. She would be drinking lots of energy drinks and coffee while rewriting and writing notes to study for. Now don't get me wrong, it's good to study and be prepared. But the way she did things was a little bit to the extreme, to the point that she wasn't getting enough sleep. So on the day of the final exams, she entered in and only had two hours of sleep. And it was funny because before we started, there was a bubble sheet exam that the teacher gave to us. And he said, before you start, you need to be listening. Because 
You don't start right away on question one. I want you to start on question 20. But my friend, she missed this, and she went straight away to number one on the bubble sheet exam. And wonder of wonders, when I looked over to her after 10 minutes into the exam, guess what she was doing? She was falling asleep. Yeah, in the middle of a final exam, not a good way to fall asleep. And then when the teacher walked by, he noticed that she was already on question 30, but she should have already been on question 50. Because if you had started on question 20, you should not already be on question 30 after 10 minutes into the exam. And so when he looked at her, he noticed that she was actually slumped over and sleeping. So he woke her up and said, hey, you need to wake up and you need to erase everything on your bubble sheet because it is wrong. You need to start all over. So at the end of the exam, she let us know that if she had gotten enough sleep, if she was listening, then her final exam would have been a breeze. It would have been easy. But since she only had two hours of sleep, she could not remember what she had studied for. Now, my brothers and sisters, there are different kinds of tests in this world. Practical tests, application tests, knowledge tests, comprehension tests, the road tests, and SAT, ACT, LSAT tests. Now, these are merely tests of what students are going through. And we all have a heavy burden on our plate when we go through the life of a student. But what about us as adults? What kind of tests do we go through? What about your knowledge about the Bible? I'm going to test you this morning about your knowledge of the Bible. Now these are pretty easy tests. So I'm pretty sure you will be able to find or know the answer. Are you ready? All right, number one. So it's okay? So the question that I was going to ask you was who were Cain and Abel's parents? It was Adam and Eve, right? So it was supposed to be written in a short line there. But I guess it didn't appear, so that's okay. And then the second question was supposed to be, what was God's promise to Noah after the flood? A rainbow. And then finally, what was it? What did God, oh no, what did Solomon ask God for? Wisdom. There you go. Okay? But what about this kind of test? Are you able to do this kind of test? Now the first few lines may be easy for you to read, but once you got to the bottom, are you still able to read that? Probably not, right? So there are tests that we can prepare for because we can study it, we know it because we understand it. But what happens if you are provided with a test like this that is beyond your control? That is beyond us, because I don't think even I cannot read it from this close what the bottom line means, or what it says. Okay. So, Terry Patrick, Patrick couldn't say anything more. Everything in life is a test. Comparing this to our relationship with God, maybe that's the reason why we don't like tests. We struggle in our relationship with God because if you serve this big God that we serve, He will always test you. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person here who knows that if you walk with God long enough, He will put you through some tests. He will probably say, you know what? Jump up and down, turn around. Juggle your marriage, juggle your work, juggle your school with everything that I have given to you along with your children. 
How do you discipline your children when you're working eight hours a day and you have to provide meals? It can be quite tough. And at the same time, God is saying, my child, you are becoming too busy with life. You need to focus your attention on me. And the only way that God can do that is by putting you through a task. So if I can get a volunteer to read this, that would be really great. So just stand up if you'd like to read this verse that is up on the board. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trial you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Thank you. Sometimes when we go through tests, we wonder, why? Why? I've been so good to you. Why is this happening? We have that tendency to forget that tests are usually given in order to discover what we, we've learned over a period of time and whether or not we can retain, comprehend, or understand what God is trying to teach us. Perhaps instead of asking God the whys of our tests and trials, we should be reflecting and asking questions of ourselves, of our relationship with God and where it stands. Are we standing with God? Or is there something obstructing our path that prevents us from standing with God? Now, there was a man in the Bible who God tested in the Old Testament. You probably think that I'm talking about Job. No, I'm talking about Abraham. So this message will be when Abraham's faith was tested. And we can find his story in the Bible in Genesis 22, verse 1 to 18. So if you have your Bibles with you, please open up to Genesis 22, verse 1 to 18, because this whole message this morning will be based on that chapter. But before we go any further, did you know that God tested Abraham after he promoted him? God often promotes or rewards his children with something before they are tested. An example of this goes back to the very beginning when there was Adam and Eve. When Adam worked his very best and was feeling lonely, God rewarded him with a counterpart named Eve. And everything was perfect, everything was good and well until God tested them. So he gave a reward and then tested. He gave Adam Eve and then tested with the knowledge of good, of evil. So there's another one, and I'm pretty sure we've studied this before because in the Victoria Church we've been going through Exodus. So there was also Moses who was rewarded by being in the palace in Egypt, right? He could have been an Israelite all his life, but instead God rewarded him, promoted him to the highest position in Egypt. But then what? He was tested, just like the rest of us, when he saw an Egyptian eating an Israelite. And he could have just ignored it, or he could have took things in a different manner in his own hands, but what did he do? He failed the test and he killed the Egyptian soldier. It is likewise for Abraham's situation. God promoted or rewarded Abraham and he gave him a promised child, Isaac. He not only gave him a covenant of a promise of being the father of many nations, but he also gave him one of his most treasured things in his life, which is his son, Isaac. As teachers, including myself, when we teach our students, we often give rewards 
gives incentives to them right after completing a task, an assessment, or a test. So shouldn't Abraham be tested first, then rewarded by God? Why would God test him after the promise? So in Future Prophets, it says, God called Abraham to be the father of the faithful, and his life was to stand as an example of faith to succeeding generations. But his faith had not been perfect. Before Abraham could be a father of many nations, God needed to test him first to see who he loved most, his son Isaac or God. And so the story begins in Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham. Abraham replies, Here I am, God. Now don't take this lightly, because in the Hebrew word, the English does not capture the full meaning of what it said of here I am. Abraham is not saying to God, here I am geographically, here I am in space. Abraham says, here I am with the intention of doing whatever you ask me to do without knowing the details. So in this posture and mindset, God is trying to get his children to have to say yes before we know the plan. To say yes before we understand the details. Abraham heard God speak, and if we're talking about prayer, prayer is not just talking to God. Prayer is about listening to God. And perhaps some of the problems that we all have is that we spend more time in prayer telling him what we want and not enough time listening to what he wants of us. Anyone guilty of doing the same thing? I mean, when trials come to us, we automatically complain and say, why God, why is this happening to me? I cannot handle this, this is too much. And we're not even listening to why God is telling us to do this. So this is where it gets a little more in depth because we need to listen and obey to what God is telling us. So in Genesis 22 verse 2, God said, Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. So you need to stay with me because God makes a distinction to Abraham. And it is important for us to understand God designates Isaac because he specifies between the manufactured and the manifested, between Ishmael and Isaac. Because Abraham and Sarah heard the promise of God, they got so impatient that they devised a plan to manufacture God's promise to them, God's blessing, God's covenant to be the father of many nations. They thought that Ishmael can be that son. But was it Ishmael or was it Isaac? So God tells Abraham that I need your son Isaac, the one whom you love, specifying not the one you manufactured with your human strength, but the one you love the most. Because the manufactured is what you worked out on your own, and I don't need the one you produced, no. 
I need the one you give back to me, the one I promised, your only son, Isaac, the one that you love. So another thing is missing there. Um, it's supposed to be from Patriot and Prophets, and it should read, Abraham had shown mistrust of God in concealing the fact that Sarah was his wife and again with his marriage with Hagar, that he might reach the highest standard, God subjected him to another test, the closest which man was ever called to endure. So can I have another person to read this verse from up above? Thank you. So just like that, whatever blessing that God gave you, you must be ready and prepared if he might take that away from you. And was he doing this to Abraham as well? Yes, he was. So God tells Abraham, what I need is the one I manifested, the one I promised with my divine power. And finally, the one you treasure the most. God wanted to discipline and mold Abraham's faith because this was the last thing in Abraham's life that was preventing him from standing with God. And he needed to undergo this test to learn and trust that God's covenant will come to pass and that it is to be the father of a great nation. After all, he needed to let God set the pace so that he could fulfill the covenant and the promise. What about us? In our day and age, don't you think that we have the tendency to do as Abraham and Sarah did? Brushing God's plan and taking measures into our own hands? So many times, People are manufacturing what God has not yet manifested, thinking that we can set our own pace and time to how our lives should work. So let me show you a funny example of a pastor who illustrates this perfectly. So. at the bottom. I think you have to escape it and then turn the video at the bottom. Yeah. So click the start again and then there should be a play button on the side. What I came to tell you is that if you let God set the pace, that he's going to be the one to fulfill the promise. And so that's why when we get on the treadmill of life, that God says, okay, I want you to walk. This guy, walking is weak. What I came to tell you is that if you let God set the pace, that he's going to be the one to fulfill the promise. And so that's why when we get on the treadmill of life, that God says, okay, I want you to walk. This guy, walking is weak. Like, God, there's so many people doing better than me. There's so many people, Father God, that are doing the right thing. And God, I just, I feel like I'm behind. I feel like you're telling me to walk and not try hard in my own strength, but obey you and do what you told me to do. Man, I'm walking these stupid laps. And it just looked, no, God, I don't think you said for me to walk. I think your word said I can do all things. Through Christ, who strengthens me. So God, I'm gonna go against everything that you've been providing for me. And I may look stupid, and I may almost fall, and then I get off. 
because I was never meant to run at that pace. And I walk away from God and I start making dumb decisions and I start taking on relationships that were never meant for me that give me a moment of relief because I was never meant to walk and many of us walk away. So that, that Christ life wasn't for me. And God said, yes, it was. I just didn't want you to run into the blessings. I wanted you to walk into them. I wanted you to know that I'm going to use the foolish things. While other people are running and spending all their energy and stunting on Instagram and doing all that other stuff, I'm going to build you in the pasture. I'm going to do you like David. Nobody even going to see you coming. And, and, then when, and then you're not going to have to position yourself. They'll call for you. And you'll be ready when it's time. See, most of us, we get away from God and we start running. We start striving. But the thing is, when God sets the pace, he doesn't change the pace. He wants a pace that's sustainable. So even if I'm like, I'm going to run back to God. I'm going to run back to him even when I get on. The pace is still the same. I can't speed up what God is doing. So what happens is we get up here and even I was, I'm trying to start running and I'm going to hurt myself trying to run when God told me to walk. So aren't we all guilty of doing the same thing? We rush into things and we don't wait on God. And that's probably one of the main issues that we need to realize. Because when God gives a promise, what it says is every promise has been fulfilled. Not a single one has failed. So when God promises you something, just wait. Wait on God. Because you will soar on wings like eagles, and he will give you what he planned, and the manifested will eventually come to, pro to fruition. And that's the best part about having a relationship with God is that we can always test God when it comes to matters of his promises. And so we just need to wait on God. And if that is the case, that we don't, this is where God intervenes back into our lives. He does it to test us and to make us realize that we need to give back to God what is rightfully his. This is his way that as a father disciplines his child to listen and obey. So back in the day, when each and every one of us used to be children, don't you think we had our own foolish mistakes? The ones that we learned from because it left us in pain, or perhaps even left a scar and not only a scar physically, but maybe in the back of our minds, we'll always remember that foolish mistake that we did as a child. Well, mine might not be sticking a fork in a electric socket, no, but mine was the hot iron. So before anything happened, my mother always taught me that when she's ironing the clothes on the board, never be near it because it is very hot. Now, to show what she made, what she means by very hot, she put a cloth on the board, and then she pressed the hot iron on the cloth. As soon as she lifted it, she grabbed my hand, and she put it on the cloth. So of course, as a child, I would feel that it is very hot. So how much more if it was the hot iron? So I listened to mom and I said, okay, I understand. I won't go near it. But guess what? One day in the apartment, my brother and I got really bored and we played hide and seek. And so I saw the best hiding place and it was in the bedroom where my mom was ironing the clothes. So there was that big cord and a basket right in front. So I thought, hmm, maybe I could crawl in and hide underneath and behind the basket. And my brother will never know. So I did just that. And guess what happened? The iron fell. While my mom was cooking in the kitchen and multitasking with ironing the clothes, the iron fell on me. Luckily, 
luckily though, it didn't burn my face, it didn't hit my head, but it did skim the side of my arm. And for many years, it left the mark. And since then, we or I have learned from that lesson. So what about you? Even as a child, you may have been tested because some way, shape, or form, you were taught, you were disciplined, you were even praised, but then somewhere along the way, when that situation happened, you needed to make a decision for yourself. In that middle of the test, did you pass or did you fail? So that's where the miracle of it all comes in, when God intervenes. So God is trying to tell you that you need to stand the test that he provides because ultimately it will strengthen you. And if you weren't listening or obeying, then how will you know that God is trying to reach you? Because he will ask of you, don't give me the thing that you could just do without. Give me the thing that you can't do without. And in a real sense, God is saying, give me back what I gave you. And that is the test and discipline of God, Jesus, like his children. Okay, can I have another volunteer to stand up and read this verse? and go stand 
your head next to the pop machine. So do a headstand at the 7-Eleven at the pop machine. She thought it was crazy. I mean, who wouldn't? Why would you do a headstand out of nowhere beside the pop machine? But the voice kept talking to her over and over again. And after about one kilometer later, she still tried to ignore that voice. So what happened was that she drove past the 7-Eleven. And still, that voice kept nagging. And she could not find a peace of mind while driving her way home. So what she did, she turned back around and she parked her car in front of the 7-Eleven store. There were no cars and not a lot of people. So this is a good thing. No one would really be staring. Okay. So she went quickly inside the store, stood right beside the pop machine, and she did a headstand. Then she quickly came down and Nothing happened. She was very embarrassed and her face was already red. So she walked out, but before she could, a young man stopped her. Excuse me, why did you just do that? She wanted to explain her banters with God in her mind, but knew how it might sound crazy to a complete stranger. So she told him, just forget it. It was, it was just nothing. I was just trying to do something that I couldn't really do. So it's okay. I'm sorry to have bothered you. I'm a little embarrassed about doing what this God had suggested. I don't even know if it was God or even my own thoughts. But I think it'll be better if I just, you know, I'm going to go back to my car. But he insisted, no, wait. I have to know why you just did that. Then he pulled a gun from out of the counter and placed it right in front of her. You see, a few minutes ago, I had this gun in my mouth. My life isn't worth living and I was going to kill myself. At the last moment, I gave God one more chance. I said, God, if you are real, why don't you send somebody in here and maybe have them do a headstand right beside that pop machine? So I really need to know, why did you do that? Was it really God speaking to you? How do you know that it was your God? Can you perhaps tell me more of this God of yours? James 2 verse 14. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that faith save anyone? God may ask us to do such strange things, maybe beyond our comfort zone or something that we are not used to. But if we listen, just like how Abraham said, here I am. I will do whatever you ask me to do without knowing the details. Then we can discover that this will develop our faith and relationship with our Savior. If it is not for us, then it is probably for the good of others. God can ask us not only to be Abraham, but he can also ask you to be like Isaac. Being that sacrificial lamb, for the sake of saving others. Just like the illustration of how this young man from the 7-Eleven store was saved simply by a woman obeying God and doing a headstand, maybe God can use you too. So, James 2 verse 17 to 18. So you see, faith by itself isn't enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it is dead and useless. God tells Abraham, I need you to go to the land of Moriah, and there I will show you. So Abraham packs 
everything that is needed for a sacrifice, then wakes his son up and takes two servants with him so that they can begin their journey to the land of Moriah. He does not know this land just yet, but God promised once again that he would show him. So Genesis 22 verse 4 to 5 says, On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little further. We will worship there and we will come right back. Abraham tells his two servants to wait there. Do you know why he asked them to wait there? Because if God asks you to go somewhere, he will get you ready to elevate you from the place you were before. If he asks you to go up there, you need to leave your spot here and go up and climb that land. And so every now and then we have people in our lives that will support us, that will take us to the foot and the bottom of that land where God has promised. But when God promises for you to climb up, you need to leave your friends, you need to leave your family because God is trying to elevate you to another place. So don't catch feelings when doors are closing and your friend isn't responding, or a relationship just ended, because that may be the chance for God to elevate you and take you to new heights. Wait on the Lord, for you will soar on with wings like eagle. Because ultimately, if you kept them in your life, they would probably talk you out of your miracle. If they were still attached to you, they would probably talk you out of your mission. We all know people who may be good for us, probably just to get us to the foot of the mountain. But did you know that there are some people who cannot climb that mountain with you? And that is why you have to promise to praise God, not only for the door he opens, but also for the door that he closes. So Abraham and Isaac go up and they worship and he tells them that me and the boy, we will go up, we will worship, and we will go back down. But didn't we just hear God ask him to sacrifice the boy? So was he mishearing things? Or was he perhaps taking a leap in faith in God? Because to kill his son, it would mean Isaac would not be coming back. Why would Abraham say, we will go, we will worship, and then we will come back? It's because Abraham finally developed that kind of faith in God. See, when you pray, you have to believe that God is able to do everything even that which is impossible. Matthew 19, verse 26, humanly speaking, it is impossible, but with God, everything is possible. And so Abraham takes the leap of faith, and he says, I don't know what is going to happen, but I do know that we are going up the mountain, and we are coming back. So Abraham makes that short of a distance, and because our time is almost up, I will just summarize what is the end of the chapter. So the question lies for Isaac is that, where is the sacrifice? So Abraham confidently replies, the Lord himself will provide a sacrifice. God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, I said. So they get up, Isaac lays down on the altar, and he is bound with his hands, and finally, Abraham is ready to pierce the dagger. 
So he has his high, arms raised high, and right before he puts the dagger through his son's body, God shouts in verse, in verse 11, Abraham, Abraham. He was so focused on what, on what God asked him to do that God had to call his name twice. But just in case, God even had an angel there to speak on his behalf. They said, don't harm the boy. Do not hurt him in any way, for I know that you truly fear God. But can you just imagine, if Abraham had stopped listening to God, he would have killed Isaac in the name of Oceans. He would have killed the promised one because he was obeying what God said rather than what God was saying in the present. And some of us are stuck in the last word that God gave. But we have not tuned our ears to keep listening. Think about how serious this is. What dream are you killing because you stopped listening to God? Some of us are about to kill something to live because you stopped praying too early. Some of you are about to destroy something God wants to build because you don't persevere in prayer. Some may have already abandoned the promise because we pray and then stop when the test comes our way. Abraham would have been disobedient if he had not had listening to God. It is exactly like how expiration dates work. On a food can, if it says that it's going to get expired next year of August, we can still eat the food. But what happens if it's past the expiration date? It can be a bit dangerous for our health because that could probably be botulism, a paralyzing bacteria that can travel through canned foods when not prepared or stored or when it's expired. So what was good for you then, it's not good for you now because it is expired. Same thing applies to our relationship with God. Are we so in tune with God that we are listening to him? We've fallen in love with the way things work, that we refuse to change the things in our lives now. I knew a church member from back in Ontario. They did more works in our church for the sake of popularity, for the sake that Oh, we are doing the best that we can so we can get praise from everyone who notices us because we are doing God's work. But guess what? They missed the whole purpose behind why God asked us to do the work. After all, both come hand in hand and is also vice versa when it says, faith without works is dead. So even if you do a lot of works, but no faith in me, God, then what you're doing is practically nothing as well. Because at the end of it, will you be saved, no matter how much works you produce? If you don't love me, at the final test, you fail, how will you be saved? So same thing happened to Abraham. When God said, I told you, is now expired. You need to be listening to what I am telling you. So don't hurt the boy, because if you keep listening, you will see that I have prepared for you a sacrifice, a substitute for your son Isaac. So Abraham looks up, and at the side he sees a ram caught in the thicket. We also need to learn that there will always be an outlet for every test once we have passed it. God will always produce a substitute, a ram, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. And it is something that we need to realize, because if Abraham was on the wrong mountain, 
Do you think that he could have found that lamb? Same thing with us. Even if we think we are doing the right thing, if God is telling you to go left, but you are going right, how will you see God's blessing at the end of the journey when there is a reward for you? In James 22, or 2, verse 22 to 24, we see Abraham's faith and his actions, it worked together. His actions made his faith complete. And so it happened, just as the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. He was even called the friend of God. So you see, we are shown to be right by, with God by what we do and not by faith alone. The message today is that some of us have fallen in love with what God has done for us, with what he is giving us, what he has blessed us with. We have fallen in love with it so much that the giver has to complete with his own gift. So God tests us, not once, not twice, but again and again, so that we can learn to choose God above all else, even our heart's desires. Ellen G. White says, God tests and proves us by the common occurrences in life. It is the little things which reveal the chapters of our heart. But again and again, because these tests will eventually enable us to stand up. Have you been listening to how God knocks at your heart? Because if you pay attention, those who know God long enough will realize that we need to let go of our idols. Because we all have an Isaac, the idols that we can't seem to let go of. And unfortunately, we are placing them first for God. Our social media image, our family, our careers, our plans for the future, school, the list can go on and on and on. But what is it that is preventing you from having faith in God and surrendering in complete obedience? Because our problem is, we think our Isaac belongs to us. If that were some of us and God tested us, asking you for your Isaac, we would have said no to God. You blessed us with this, God? Why do I need to give it to you? I am keeping this. I don't want to give it back. And others would probably just make endless excuses. But understand, anything you receive from God does not belong to you. It is on loan to you. Whenever God asks for it back, we cannot be stingy or hold on to it, because if it had not been for God, you would not have that blessing in your life. So what I'm trying to say is, you are not blessed just for you to be blessed. Just like the lady from the 7-Eleven store, just as Isaac was not only for Abraham, God called Abraham to be the father of the faithful. And his life was to stand as an example of faith to generations to generations. Your salary is not just to take care of your bills and your family and your expenses or build up your savings, no. But as a believer, your salary is to be invested in the work of the kingdom of God. Same thing goes with your time. How do you manage your time? Do you spend it with God? Or do you spend it more on TV, on your phone, with friends? God calls you to stand up to these tests. We need to, be, we need to stop being sleeping Christians and get moving on our faith. Our steadfast prayers, listening to God, and giving Him our complete obedience. Because endurance and perseverance, we need that to withstand the test 
of time. And I'm not referring to right now, our tests right now. No, I'm referring to the end times because whether we are prepared or not, it is coming. God is coming again, and he will come in the thief of the night, like a thief in the night. And are you going to be prepared for when that final test comes your way? Because God is going to ask you, just like how Ellen G. White says, you need to let go of the things that hold you back in your relationship with God. Because guess what? On your journey up, it's going to be arduous. And it's going to get narrower and narrower and narrower. You need to develop your strength, your endurance, your perseverance. And our faith by now, brothers and sisters, should be mature and complete to the point that we are saving souls and winning souls every day. And to the point that we are willing to be like Isaac, being that sacrificial lamb. God is calling you to stand the tests because the harvest is too great and the workers are few. And he is calling you today to do only what you can do, not what I can do, not what she can do or he can do, but something only you can do. Maybe it's for your family. Maybe it's for that person on the streets who just needs food. Maybe it's just a friend who needs a hug to say, hey, how are you today? I did not see you at church. I'm concerned. Can I pray for you? It's little things like this that we can be a blessing to others. So I'd like to leave these thoughts in mind along with our scripture reading. Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, for whenever you face trials of any kind, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So with that, there is one last video. And that will be
us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for everything that you have blessed us. We ask that uh, we may retain and we may remember what we have learned today. And may we remember, Lord, that no matter what you ask of us to do, no matter what you ask us to give back, help us, Lord, to give what we can and to give everything because you have died on the cross for us. Help us, Lord, to be prepared and to do what needs to be done in saving and living souls, not only for our faith, but for the faith of others as well. Forgive us for our sins, and thank you.